Today, Kong is an icon that transcends the genre. The giant gorilla has inspired multiple generations of filmmakers, from Ray Harryhausen to Steven Spielberg, and even more recently, Peter Jackson. His likeness has been used in commercials, books, and many, many films. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who's not at least familiar with his name. It's strange to think that before the release of King Kong in March 1933, he existed in the mind of one man. Marion Caldwell Cooper was born in Jacksonville, Florida on October 24th, 1893. The youngest of three children, when he was six years old he was given a book by his uncle called Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. The book instilled in young Cooper a thirst for adventure and exploration. He would train his body, learn survival skills, as well as the craft of map making to dedicate himself to this purpose. The book also contained an interesting story about a group of gorillas that terrorizes a village. One gorilla carries off a native woman into the jungle. This story in particular fascinated Cooper. This began a lifelong interest with the animals. Cooper joined the U.S. Naval Academy in 1911, but was expelled in 1916 for neglecting his studies, being more fascinated with women and aviation. With the start of World War I, Cooper tried to join the war effort in Europe by becoming a seaman and joining the Merchant Marines, where he would make his way to London and quite literally jump ship. He was caught immediately and was shipped back to the United States. Cooper would join the war proper with the U.S. in 1917 as part of the Army Signal Corps as a pilot. He would run many successful missions as a bomber. On September 26th, 1918, Cooper was shot down. The plane caught fire after taking machine gun fire in a dogfight with German planes. Cooper considered jumping out without a parachute before seeing that his co-pilot, who was shot through the neck during the fight, was still alive. Cooper instead tried to take the plane into a dive to smother the flames. This miraculously worked and the two survived the crash. Cooper would severe burns to his hands that would scar them for life. They were presumed dead, but actually captured by the Germans. He would spend the remainder of the war a prisoner. After the war, he would join the Polish army as an American volunteer for the Polish-Soviet War. He formed the Kazutsko Squadron and would fly in over 70 combat missions, dropping bombs and machine gunning troops. Cooper would be shot down again on July 13, 1920, this time being captured by the Red Cavalry, who were ruthless with prisoners. If Cooper had given his name, he would have been killed on the spot being the squadron leader. He was spared due to them assuming he was a peasant because of his scarred hands. He would spend the remainder of this war in a POW camp. Cooper would not be released when the war was over. He was American and was considered a criminal and not a prisoner of war. Instead, Cooper was sent to a labor camp where he would remain until April 12, 1922, when he escaped with fellow prisoners and traveled by night over 500 miles through Russian forests, stealing food and supplies while evading authorities, even having to kill a Soviet soldier that threatened to expose them. They eventually made it over the Latvian border, using a smuggler to get them across. Upon his return to Poland, Cooper was given the highest honor and offered money and land for his contributions to the war effort. Cooper denied this, not wanting to be seen as profiting on war. He would then return to America. After returning from overseas in 1922, Cooper would work the night shift at the New York Times. He would put together an autobiography around this time from his writings while in captivity, titled Things Men Died For. A woman named Marguerite Harrison, who saved Cooper's life when he was a prisoner of war by smuggling in food, heard about the book and told him that things written about her could endanger her life because she was engaged in espionage work against the Bolshevists. Cooper then bought up every copy in existence, some 5,000 copies, and had them destroyed, keeping one for himself and one for Dagmar Matson who had the manuscript. Cooper would travel to Asia with his friend Ernest Schutzack, who worked as a cameraman in World War I. The duo met during his time in the American Relief Organization after the war ended. They would go on many adventures in Asia. Cooper would write articles about this for Asia Magazine. Schutzack would also teach Cooper the art of filmmaking during this time. The expedition ended due to the ship they were using, the Wisdom II, burning down in the harbor. Cooper and Schutzack would become frequent collaborators from here on out, working on many natural dramas as the two called them, such as Grass in 1925, a story about a tribe's hazardous month-long migration to reach grass to feed their livestock. Cooper funded this by borrowing $10,000 from his family and $10,000 from a very appreciative Marguerite Harrison who also wanted to join them on the journey, which Shodzak was not enthusiastic about due to the hazardous and arduous nature of the expedition. Grass would become a success, prompting the two to film another film, Chang, in 1927, which proved how adventurous the duo was. Shodzak was almost killed by a tiger but got some amazing footage from the tree he was in. You can see just how close he got because the camera lacked the ability to zoom in. There was also a breathtaking elephant stampede through a native village that bears a striking resemblance to Kong's rampage through a similar native village. The film was also a success, but Cooper kept getting the critique that if his movies had a romance plot, it would gross more money, something he would remember for his later films. The duo would also make The Four Feathers, released in 1929. 
an adaptation of a book Cooper read while he was a prisoner of war. They would cast Faye Ray as the romantic lead for the film, and it was here that they would first meet David Selznick, who produced the picture. In 1929, Cooper, jaded by the politics in Hollywood, accepted appointments to the board of directors of two airlines, Pan Am Airways and Western Air Express, moving to New York. After several years, Cooper would grow bored with a job and return to Hollywood at the request of Selznick, who had become the vice president of the struggling RKO Pictures. Cooper would become his executive assistant. He would evaluate all the projects currently in production and choose which ones to shut down and which ones to continue with. It was here that Cooper came across the film Creation. He didn't think much of the script, but was very impressed with the special effects by O'Brien. Here finally was a means to bring to life a picture Cooper had in his mind for years. If you listen to Cooper's version of how he came up with the idea for King Kong, ever the showman, he would have told you of walking the streets of New York and looking up at some biplanes flying near the Empire State Building, and imagining them fighting a large creature atop the structure. In truth, the idea likely came about in stages. Cooper read a book called The Dragon Lizards of Komodo by W. Douglas Burden, who was a good friend of Cooper's. The book details the exploits of Burden discovering the giant lizards thought to be extinct, but still surviving on this island. He named them after the island they were discovered on, Komodo, and captured two of them to bring back to a zoo. The lizards would die in captivity. Cooper had a concept for a gorilla picture he'd been thinking of making about a gorilla making off with a woman. The fate of the Komodo dragons brought back to civilization where they could not survive was another concept Cooper liked and decided to combine the ideas and made that the fate of his gorilla. Before seeing the test footage from O'Brien's creation, Cooper originally wanted to bring a group of gorillas to the island of Komodo and have them fight against the Komodo dragons. Thankfully, he was talked out of this idea due to the time and cost. He would share his idea for the film with O'Brien, who would draw up concept art of a hunter and a woman encountering a gorilla that O'Brien scaled up to about 10 feet to add impact. It was probably this that inspired Cooper to make his gorilla giant. They also had the leftover dinosaur models that could be used to fight with the giant terror gorilla, as it was currently being called, replacing the Komodo dragons, which probably also played a part in scaling up the gorilla's size. It was around this time, whether he got the idea from looking up at the Empire State or not, that Cooper decided to incorporate his gorilla climbing the tallest building in the world, which was just completed in 1931, the Empire State Building. Taking inspiration from his other passion flying, having the giant terror gorilla fighting them atop a building. By this point, Cooper would also come up with the name of Kong for the beast. Cooper liked short one-syllable words, and liked harsh-sounding words such as words beginning with the letter K. It's probably shortened the name of one of the places he originally wanted to set the film, the Congo, changed the C with a stronger-looking K. It's also possible he got it from the word Komodo. Edgar Wallace would be tapped to write the screenplay based on an outline from Cooper. Wallace had written many best-selling mystery novels. Cooper also wanted to write a book version so he could advertise the film as based on the novel by Edgar Wallace. Wallace, a legendarily fast writer, would start the script January 1st, 1932, and finish it just four days later. The draft titled The Beast bared little resemblance to the finished film, such as having a woman captured by a bunch of escaped convicts brought to the island, and Denim being a big game hunter. Cooper thought the draft promising, but it still needed a lot of work. Wallace would pass away from complications from diabetes and double pneumonia February 10th, 1932, shortly after starting script revisions. Even though very little, if anything, from Wallace's version made it into the film, Cooper still gave him co-credit for the King Kong story in the final film to keep his word to Wallace, and Wallace's name attached gave it more credibility anyway. Cooper returned to James Krillman to write the next draft of the script. The two were already working together on the most dangerous game. Krillman would turn in a second draft now titled The Eighth Wonder. This draft would be more recognizable, with Denim now being a filmmaker leading an expedition to Kong's Island. A later draft of The Eighth Wonder by Horace McCoy, who helped Cooper on the script when the most dangerous game was taking too much of Krillman's time, would add in the natives to Kong's Island. Krillman didn't like this change, feeling it made the film too fantastical. He would continue with a new idea despite this. During the same time, Cooper and O'Brien would put together some test footage for the studio that could then be later incorporated into the film to save money. They came up with a scene of Kong shaking sailors off a of log, as well as a scene of Kong fighting a T-Rex. A quick anecdote about the T-Rex. Cooper is the only one that, who refers to it as an Allosaurus in interviews. However, the creature was meant to be a T-Rex for creation. The armature did have three fingers, but it was thought that the T-Rex had three fingers at the time. The script only refers to it as the meat eater. Selznick used concept art of these scenes to convince the board to greenlight the $10,000 they would need to film the scenes. Marcel Delgado would construct an armature of Kong using a similar process to the armatures for The Lost World, but adding rabbit fur for Kong's pelt. He would go through several designs before Cooper was satisfied with it. Cooper would use the jungle sets of the most dangerous game being filmed at the same time to film the live action portions of the scenes. 
He would also borrow Fay Ray and Robert Armstrong from the cast of the film. The test footage finished, the board knowing a fake documentary called Ngagi about gorillas did very well at the box office a few years earlier, and seeing the test footage, were impressed enough to put it into production. The budget was set at around $500,000, which was double the budget of an average big budget film at the time. Kong was never a B-movie. Due to the similarities with The Lost World, the studio bought the rights to the film, as well as the book, so it wouldn't be a problem. Many cost-cutting measures would be used. The dinosaur armatures made for creation were already paid for. The jungle scenes would be filmed on the sets made for the most dangerous game, saving further money. The wall set would be a repurposed set from the 1927 silent film The King of Kings. Cooper would cast Faye Ray as Anne Darrow, telling Ray that she would have the tallest, darkest leading man in Hollywood. Robert Armstrong would play Carl Denham, and a newcomer, Bruce Cabot, for his first starring role as Jack Driscoll. Frank Riker would portray Captain Anglehorn, and Noble Johnson the native chief. Principal photography would technically begin in May 1932 with the filming of the test reel footage. Since the most dangerous game sets were set for demolition shortly after this, Cooper would film all the jungle scenes at this time. Shooting from Krillman's draft of the screenplay as Ruth Rose, Shodzak's wife, was currently at work rewriting the script. Shodzak would handle the other live-action sequences while Cooper would focus on the special effects sequences. The live-action filming was a stop-and-go affair as they had to wait for the film to be greenlit after filming the test footage, and would then have to wait for the special effects footage to be finished for rear projection shots. There would be months in between filming scenes due to this. Faye Ray would have time to film three or four films in between her time working on Kong. Ruth Rose would put the finishing touches on the screenplay during this time. Rose would streamline the plot, adhering to Cooper and Shotzak's three Ds, distance, drama, and danger, while also adding in the beginning sequence of Denim finding Anne in New York. It was Rose who would have his cut right from Kong's capture on the island to New York with no explanation as to how he would have gotten there. We're millionaires, boys! I'll share it with all of you! Why, in a few months, it'll be up in lights on Broadway. Kong, the eighth wonder of the world! She would also spruce up the dialogue. Biographical elements were given to some of the characters. Anne Darrow would be based on Rose herself. Jack Driscoll would be based on her husband, Shotzak. And Carl Denham would be based on Cooper. Cooper gave her the instruction to give the script the feel of a real cooper Shotzak expedition. A task she was more than ready for, having accompanied them on several such expeditions. Cooper loved Rose's final script, and put it into production, now under the name Kong. Stop motion would be used to bring Kong and the dinosaurs to life. O'Brien would have a small team of animators to help out this time. A life-size bust of Kong was made to film close-ups of the face. Several life-size hands were made, one to hold Fay Ray, and the one that could not articulate its fingers, to reach for Jack during a log scene. A life-size foot was made so Kong could be shown to crush people beneath his feet. Just about every special effect you could think of was used in Kong. Matte paintings, composite images, rotoscoping, rear screen projection, traveling maps, both the Dunn and Williams process would be used. There were several innovations used in Kong as well. One is the use of a new screen for the rear screen projection, the art of projecting an image on a screen and having the actors in the foreground reacting to it. The screen was able to keep a clear image with no hotspots due to new materials being used. Another way O'Brien came up with for having live action actors in the same shot as the stop motion was to have a mini projector projecting live action footage onto a tiny screen in the stop motion shot. When O'Brien would animate the armatures, he would advance the live action shot by one frame as well. The finished shot would make them both appear to move together in the same shot. O'Brien would be able to get a patent for this process. Linwood Dunn, who did most of the composite shots for King Kong, would create a new optical printer during the production, greatly improving the Williams process for traveling matte shots as well. O'Brien and Cooper would clash on the animation. O'Brien would put in some lighthearted elements to Kong's animation, which Cooper did not agree with, wanting Kong to look ferocious. O'Brien would walk off the set several times in frustration, but would always return. Some of the scenes, such as Kong checking if the T-Rex is dead by playing with the jaws, and him looking for a flower to pick up for Anne in his cave before the Elasmosaur attacks, made it into the film, giving Kong a certain character in life he otherwise wouldn't have. When it came time with the scenes with the biplane shooting at Kong, Cooper and Shotzak would pilot the plane that takes the last shot taking Kong down, Cooper stating, we ought to kill the son of a bitch ourselves. Several scenes were deleted for various reasons, due to cost, time, or just stopping the flow of the movie. Most of these were never actually filmed, just test footage made. Kong fighting a group of triceratops that would incorporate footage from creation would be cut, as well as a scene where the sailors are chased by an arsenitherium, later a styracosaur, to the log where they would run into Kong. This was supposed to explain why the sailors didn't simply go back across the log. A shot of Kong climbing the mountain to his lair was cut for pacing. A scene where Kong jumps from building to building making his way to the Empire State Building was also cut. The most famous of these deleted scenes is the lost spider pit sequence. 
It meant to take place after Kong shakes all the sailors off of the log. They were supposed to be devoured by several spiders, large insects, and lizards. The myth is that during a test screening it was deemed too much of a shock to audiences and stopped the film cold, so Cooper cut it. There is debate as to whether the scene was filmed at all, and if it was, whether or not it was actually shown in a test screening before being cut. Murray Spivak would provide the sound for the film having the difficult task of coming up with voices for creatures that no longer exist, in some cases never existed. For people screaming, he would often fill in with his own screams. Kong's roar was a lion and tiger played backwards and pitched down. Kong's croaking sounds would be made by Spivak himself. His chest beating would be Spivak hitting his assistant's chest and recording it from his back. The T-Rex's distinctive hiss sound was made by Spivak himself. Max Steiner would provide the score for the film. The studio did not want to pay for an original score, so Cooper fronted $50,000 of his own money to pay for it. The result is one of the most enduring film soundtracks in history. Film scoring was still in its infancy, and Steiner would do many things never done, such as matching Noble Johnson's steps down the stairs with the music. And using the score is the sound of the elasmosaur hitting the ground when Kong slams it. The film completed, one last hookup had to be hashed out. The studio did not want to go with the name Kong, seeing it as confusing and people possibly thinking it had something to do with Cooper's previous film, Chang. The compromise was the final name of the film, King Kong. The film mostly being finished and clocking in at 13 reels. Cooper would say, no film of mine will be released at 13 reels. I'll film another reel if I have to. Cooper was not a superstitious man. This was likely an excuse he would use to add a scene of Kong attacking a train. Cooper hated the train in question, living near it in his time in New York so we had Kong destroy it. Ted Cheeseman would edit the film with Cooper. The two eventually got the final film edited down to 11 reels. King Kong is the story of filmmaker Carl Denham leading an expedition to Kong's Island, intending to shoot a film about the beast or whatever is there. In need of a female lead for his picture, he finds out-of-work actress Anne Darrow. And once they get to the island, the natives wish to trade several of their women for Anne, intending to give her to their god, Kong. The crew refuses and returns to the ship where Anne is then kidnapped by the natives and given over to Kong. The crew chases Kong across the jungle, running across many dinosaurs and Kong himself, who kills all but Jack and Denim. Jack continues on to save Anne while Denim goes back for help. After saving Anne from the T-Rex, Kong brings her to his lair on top of Skull Mountain. There, Jack saves her while Kong is fighting a Pteranodon. Kong chases them back to the wall, where he terrorizes the native village looking for Anne until Denim gets him with a gas bomb. Kong is brought to New York where the beast escapes and rampages through New York, recapturing Anne and climbing the Empire State Building. Biplanes are sent to shoot Kong down. After Kong is killed, the police chief says the airplanes got him, prompting Denim to reply, it wasn't the airplanes, it was beauty killed the beast. King Kong would have a staggered release. New York's two largest theaters would show it on March 2nd, 1933. The world premiere was at the Chinese Theater on March 23, 1933. The film opened nationwide April 10, 1933. Even at the height of the Great Depression, King Kong was a massive success. It provided escapism for audiences in the throes of the worst economic downturn in the country's history. Kong's success would spawn an immediate sequel and many imitations. Giant gorillas were now firmly in the world's zeitgeist. Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see, please consider subscribing to the channel or giving the video a like or commenting on what you think. I really appreciate everyone that does, and I'll see you in the next one.